Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of VIPs in Action, Village Innovative Perinatal Support in Action, brought to you by Rose Breastfeeding Incorporated here in the metro Atlanta area and JMM Health Solutions. My name is Dr. Joanne Michelle Martin. I'm the CEO and founder of JMM Health Solutions, a pelvic health practice here in the metro area. And today I have with me Marquita White. I'm so excited to talk to her about what she's doing in her community. Like many of the other um, guests that we've had on this show, I've been so privileged to sit down and be able to chat with so many influential individuals who are making a difference in maternal health throughout this country. And she is definitely no exception. So Marquita is a founder and the a community advocate um, of the nonprofit organization called Mommies in the D, which addresses lack of advocacy to teen mothers um, to access resources that they need to ensure self-efficiency um, in motherhood and personal endeavors. She's got a background in teaching and leadership and has this concept of servanthood in mind, which is so, so important when you get into this work. So without further ado, because I mean, she's got, I mean, like her bio is like, yeah, you like y'all, if y'all could see me, it's like, she, I mean, she is awesome. She is awesome. And I don't want to take away her shine. So without further ado, I want to introduce you guys to Marquita. Marquita, how are you? I'm doing good. Hi, how are you guys doing? I'm doing good. This is yeah, it's a snowy day here, but we're doing amazing here. So it's awesome to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And where is here? Because there, right now today, there is snow in Texas, if you can believe yes. it. <laughs> yes, I saw. I saw the pictures on Facebook. Wow, we have the same amount of snow on the ground. I'm in Detroit. Ah. And so we're looking at two feet of snow right now, nine inches expected today. So, woo, it's, it's okay. I bought all my groceries. I hope you bought all your groceries. Can I have some snow? Can I, can I have some snow? Can I have oh, a flurry? Can I have a no, flurry for 500? I'll, I'll actually pack a <laughs> Ziploc bag for you and I'll ship it on your way. I got you. <laughs> oh man. I'm like, I'm missing out on all the fun. I'm like, can I get some flurries? Can I get something? Just no, something. It's not, it's, it's not as fun. It's not as fun to drive in, but it's okay. You know, it's okay. I'll, I'll pack you up a bag. I, I'm sure I can have I, enough snow left. <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate you. So tell us a little bit about Mommies in the D. What got you started? Um, especially because you're working with teen moms, right? Yes. And a lot of a lot of people when they hear maternal health, they think, you know, adults, you know, um, birthing individuals who are usually adults or at least older, more established, yes. but not very many people talk about teen pregnancy. And then helping those individuals to better be able to navigate pregnancy, motherhood, and just the journey ahead that they have, which can be a very, very tough and tumultuous one for some of them. So tell us a little bit more about that and how you got started. Sure, Dr. J. So Mommies in the D started off as an idea, off as a purpose mission that I was on to better serve students that I saw getting pregnant at early ages. Um, when I worked at AmeriCorps and City Year, I worked in the Osborne community in Detroit. It's an inner Detroit community, a uh, really underserved community. Um, and I saw that a lot of my students were getting pregnant. Some of their dreams were turning from what were they going to wear for uh, for prom or what, th what did they want to do when they grew up uh, to, oh my goodness, how am I going to take care of this child? And so literally what I did was buckle down on understanding who the resources were, um, making sure that I was answering to some of their fears of being a parent, but understanding that when I grew up, I understood there were resources for breastfeeding, there were resources for mothers who didn't understand where to go when it came to getting prenatal care. Um, I also understood that the Detroit, um, the community is pretty strong. So when it comes to young mothers, why was there a disconnect on where are the resources compared to uh, what they knew to be resources? A lot of times when you look at young mothers, uh, especially since they're operating out of fear, they're definitely looking at um, hiding their pregnancy or trying to cover it up as long as they can to preserve their egos or preserve the opportunities to, uh, to be seen as successful. But what I saw was, a need to empower them, a need to bring them together because they were sharing some of those same fears. They were sharing some of those same needs for the maternal community that already stands in Detroit. So what I was doing was, uh, at first I started off with 
um, resources such as donations, or I took a couple of mothers to um, breastfeeding classes uh, that were already standing with Benfa or understanding who was in the hospital. So when Network, who stands here and helps prenatal help breastfeeding or just even sister friends who mentors who puts mentorships to, together between big sisters and little sisters and so what mommies in the d does is they empower mothers to achieve their personal and parental goals by establishing growth center environments and this really means creating a safe environment for them to say, okay, we understand that you're pregnant, but this does not stop you going to school. This does not stop you having a healthy pregnancy, a healthy childbirth, or being a better parent, um, being a parent that doesn't have to stop their goals, and even becoming a woman. All of these things can coexist, and I'm here to support you. And so we, we do that by bridging the resources um, and making sure that we're bringing the resources to the mothers. So that's basically how Mommies in the D got started. We started off with seven mothers. I sat down with those moms and we had a conversation about starting something that was going to impact more mothers. And so this was in 2017 and now it's 2020 um, or 2020, we're able to continue to grow to 75 mothers. And now in 2021, we are now continuing to do the work, especially virtually to reach the mothers who might not know that, hey, these resources are out here. Let's go ahead and empower you. Let's empower you uh, in your goals for personal, personal achievements and even parenting achievements and making sure that you feel supported and know that you have a, a safe space to come to, to explore what those options are. That is amazing. And you're so right, because a lot of young women, it, it's almost like, okay, I'm pregnant. It's the end of the world. I will never be successful. I will never make anything of myself. I will never do this. I will never do that because society has put such a stigma on who they are and who they will become um, that for a lot of these women, it's really, really hard. And just the concept for them to beat the odds or to think that they're able to beat the odds is hard, let alone now they've got to care for somebody else. Right. <laughs> you know, now they've got to try and figure that out. And, and they oftentimes may or may not have support. They, you know, families abandon them or maybe they just didn't have any support to begin with. So I really do love this initiative. I think that this is, this is a beautiful thing. I think this is very empowering. And I think that more communities need to have programs like this available to help moms better navigate um, these circumstances. So with COVID looming, in 2020. Now, I know you said you guys started in 2017. Mm -hmm. You guys started with seven. You grew to 75. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty commendable, especially because you're the one in there. You know, it's not like you just kind of patched them off to somebody else. You are actively working with these women, which mm -hmm. takes a lot of time. So to grow that much, that fast is amazing. Um, what challenges did you face or what challenges came up as a result of COVID, as a result of lockdowns and all these different things that were happening last year? Yes, yeah, so 2020 actually was an opportunity for us to grow. Interestingly enough, as I said before, this is definitely coming from a passion project. So I was thinking, make sure you're working with the moms on the weekends, make sure that you're connecting with uh, the partners during the weekdays, but it might be after hours where you're applying to emails. And so I was really holding a full time job that kind of stopped because of COVID. But that was an opportunity for me to see the real need when it came to what mothers might be going through, especially young mothers that might not have a lot of work experience. They might be the first ones out the door of, a, of job security. And they also might just in general be going through a lot because the focus probably went off of their needs and on to, okay, so how are we going to hold up this household? And from their parent standpoint, because a lot of them don't have their own space, they're still living with their parents. And so a lot of times that focus goes off of those moms. And what happened in 2020 was pretty extravagant because I was able to take a pause with my job, uh, with my full-time job, and to help understand what these moms were really looking at, but also uh, help them understand a little bit more about empowering them to continue forward with their goals. And so what 2020 did was really give me a, a access to understanding technology in a larger way, understanding that, hey, we might not be able to meet 
in person, but moms, we want you to continue to be interactive online. We want you to continue to use Messenger on Facebook. We want you guys to continue to build community, continue to post statuses where you're asking questions about motherhood or you're expressing joys about your motherhood and just continuing to pull them together to let them know even on virtual, you all have a community. And so especially when it came to Black Breastfeeding Week, um, that was an extraordinary time because we were able to hold panels that were were virtual that were expressing the importance of breastfeeding. What was the stigma? What are some of the stigmas around breastfeeding? What are some of the rates around infant mortality and um, maternal mortality rates? And how does this relate back to young mothers, especially with all of the craziness and turmoil that was going on with police brutality? I was able to have conversations with my mothers on. How are you all planning to raise this black royalty in your home, understanding that the world might not be ready for them or the world might be intimidated by them? And so if I was to look at any of the, um, the barriers that might have uh, stopped me or hindered me from success, it would possibly be the, the hindrance of not knowing who in my community was able to also like kind of shut down what they were doing to kind of help this, help push this forward. Because I actually was working all by myself. Like I'm finally starting to get a team, but I was working by myself to understand what is some of the curriculum that we're going to be working on on Sunday, fun day, or who, who are the moms that I'm going to be able to pull together to do these certain events, you know, really pulling on my moms and for their expertise and just the community building aspects that they have. And just making sure that the moms were able to be served in the way that they wanted to. Um, a lot of them knew that, Hey, this is an opportunity for us to fly on the radar, but making sure that these moms knew that, Hey, like we want to make sure we're bringing in as many moms that need help because the idea is that they want to be empowered but they also need to know hey when you're pregnant and it's, and it's a pandemic it might look different and to learn the resources that are available we need to make sure that they're getting to um re, like they need to get, get to resources that do have the availability to um, talk to them a little bit more and advocate for them a little bit more tell them what a doula is tell them um how to uh, navigate their pregnancy or navigate breastfeeding with COVID how to pick their partner, how to pick their birth team, things like that, because we understood that um, COVID was definitely a time where it, it just didn't look how it used to. And so, um, so just making sure we have more people on deck to be able to spread that word uh, as far as the other community organizations, that, that would have really been helpful, um, especially with the influx of moms coming in. And I actually wanted to let you know how I was able to achieve all of these mothers if I could. Yeah, so, um, absolutely. Yeah. So mommy's day is an opportunity to empower young mothers on mother's day. As I said before, we all know that the focus definitely goes on the mothers uh, of the mothers, you know, but usually we don't focus on the young mothers. They usually kind of wash that day off and celebrate their own mothers. But on this day, we usually want to empower the young mothers give them something to keep going forward, um, such as encouraging letters and such as free giveaways like diapers and wipes and Sunday fun day kits for their children, which are parent uh, or parent child interaction activities. So it focuses on STEM activities and the moms love that. Um, just being able to work with their children on different activities. And so we're able to do self care because we understand that this is a crazy time for us, but just giving out those self care kits and seeing who what moms wanted to be involved in this movement of the mommy's day, we're able to get th that many responses. And so bringing them in, getting them to know what mommy's in the D is, um, this this was one of the biggest giveaways, and this was uh, solely community funded. So the community really showed out. We started to go fund me to make sure that the moms were able to have this, uh, this or the moms were able to have these nice giveaways. And so it was really an amazing opportunity to get, gain all the mothers to give out resources and to also let them know, hey, like we're here and we're here to support you. We are solely here to support you and bring you to the resources that you need and you deserve as a parent. And we want to make sure that we're being here as a community because this definitely um, is a village and, and we want to make sure that we're a part of that for these young mothers. 
That's amazing. That's amazing. Did you find that there were other, I know you said that one of the big, the hardest things was knowing who was available. Mm -hmm. So COVID, COVID came, shut everything down. You were able to, to switch to virtual, but for some people, some practices, some, um, birth professionals, it, it took them a little bit longer to make that switch. And were you finding that there were a lot of people in your community who were able to pivot pretty quickly and continue to serve? Or was there like a lack or a deficit in that? So I would say that there might have been a pause, but there was not a lack because the communications that I was already having with the community organizations they were letting me know, hey, we're going to be doing virtual now that we are in COVID. We're just going to continue on, but we're going to do it on the virtual platform. They were letting me know of their flyers that they had sent out. And so for our panels for Black Breastfeeding Week, we were able to push out the advertisement for those virtual programs. And even when it was time to go to school, we have one of our it's basically a parenting school, but for youth, you know, um, basically this high school wanted to make sure we were catching some of the moms that were needing to go back to school or possibly want to go back to school. But, you know, this time is going to be virtual. But since every school is virtual, they wanted to, you know, really have students access their resources as well. So making sure that we're pushing out that advertisement and really taking, um, heat of the understanding of the audience that was coming in to Mommies in the D's uh, virtual platforms was important. So we were able to get those resources out. But as I said before, it definitely takes a village. So when it when we pass out the flyers, it really does take, especially on social media, sharing, making sure the moms know to, hey, pass this off. If they know someone that's giving away uh, clothes or giving away food or giving away diapers, we pass that information off. And so that travels way faster virtually which is a place so it definitely um, was a pivot but I did see that a lot of organizations were taking the necessary steps to go ahead and turn things virtual so we could continue the community aspect so it didn't fly on the radar the people's needs and so we wanted to make sure that we um, were able to be accessible and so for for us for example we're really big on using messenger um, our moms know to go through the zoom platform or our website to go to the events however Facebook, Facebook Messenger, um, even Instagram are really great avenues to message the clients and message the moms um, and message even partners to make sure that we're getting who needs something, uh, getting them to the resources that they need immediately. Yeah, that's a great use of social media. So a lot of people oftentimes say, you know, social media is bad. And I'm like, yeah, it's all in how you use it, right? And yes. for a lot of people, that's the way to connect. And, and when you're talking about teen moms, the, the people on social media the most are the teenagers. So they right. know Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'm surprised that they're using Facebook Messenger as much because I, I don't know that many teens, you know, are flocking to Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and all these other things. And so I think that's a great use of social media as a way to draw those moms in and to connect with them and, and maintain those connections. And like you said, even with the partners, because they're just as important, right? We've mm -hmm. got to educate them too. We've got to make sure that they have resources as well. So you are a recipient of the grant from Rose, the Rose VIP grant. Yes. And how has that grant been able to fund and fuel a lot of the initiatives that you've been um, doing throughout this whole time and for, to allow you to continue to serve these moms? Yes, so I'm super grateful for the VIPS grant because this is actually my first grant. As I let you know, this has been community funded this whole time um, or even out of my own money to make sure that the moms are getting what they need. So the grant really allowed me to look at my platform of how I was delivering services, be able to bring more people on um, to the team and to really understand how do we create community among mothers? What are mothers asking for in community, sir, uh, community groups. And so what I was able to do and what I'm still launching off is our Mommy Circle series. So the Mommy Circle series will actually be where we have a space and speak about specific topics that can help mothers achieve their goals. We are launching three mommy circles, which is set a strong foundation, keeping a strong foundation, and your mental health 
matters. These mommy circles will all focus on either prenatal um, health, postnatal health and understanding the cognitive development or developmental stages of their child and also their mental health. So what does self-care look like? Some of the moms never even heard about postpartum depression. They might sweep it under the rug or not even uh, try to put trauma, the traumas that they deal with from being an underserved community because we know that there's definitely studies on that. But the biggest thing is how do we balance off parenthood, the stresses of going to school or work? How do we advocate for ourselves? Um, and what does that mental health look like? Because we don't want them to push down just because they're young, the need for that self-care. Um, we, we know that, that that is something that's so big right now, especially as a lot of them are going through a, a lot of different changes. And so what we're doing is we are focusing on cohorts and evaluation to make sure that this model works so we can expand it in a, in a bigger way to where this will be a normal thing. And the grant allow us to be able to bring in evaluation uh, coordinators to be able to look at the platform of the curriculum. Um, it allowed me to be able to develop the curriculum and even allow me to understand, interview and bring on other partners. So we know that the community partners that actually offer the prenatal services, that actually offer the breastfeeding support in Detroit, that actually offer um, therapy uh, and, and counseling sessions in Detroit or even self care uh, avenues, we're bringing them all to the space. So mommies, me organi uh, organizations that are here to support them. And these will be 90 minute uh, sessions where mothers are able to meet the organizations, do interactive activities such as making a mommy, like possibly a mommy um, empowerment tool where they know who their team is in childbirth. They know who to go to, or these are the resources that we'll go to while I'm pregnant, um, how to involve the fathers, how to uh, continue to understand breastfeeding and work against those, work against the odds of what community stigmas might be around breastfeeding. Um, and, and definitely just making sure that mo mothers are connecting to their children. Um, so when we're talking about the moms might be balancing a lot of things, balancing work, balancing school, and then coming home and balancing you know, two or three children can be hard. So Sunday fun days actually help with that. And the Sunday fun days are monthly interactive activities. And we're doing those virtually now that enhance kindergarten and school readiness. So we offer these for our mothers that have two to five year olds. And so these ch uh, parent child interactions are a lot of fun. Um, and these are also going with the keeping a strong foundation. So supporting those moms that might have multiple children, continuing to see, okay, like this, this is what it looks like to put my child child in daycare, or this is what it looks like for me to be able to um, understand what my child's love language is, what their developmental stages are, so I can spend more time and understand who this child is as their own person. So these are some of the great things that we're doing with the VIPS grant. Um, we are even launching our goal planning sessions, which are one-on-one uh, one -on -one meetings with the mothers to answer some of their specific needs um, and to get them into the right hands of the, uh, which mommy circles that will, will be helpful for them, but also the organizations, because some mothers might not exactly want to answer to the community uh, group aspect, and that's okay, but sometimes answering to those one-on-one um, one on one situations and making sure that the moms know that we care. And, you know, I definitely care about getting them into the right hands. Uh, that's why we created the goal planning session. And so we were actually able to kick off a, a goal, the goal planning session by a vision board party. So, you know, just to get them started to talk about what SMART goals are and how to reach their goals. So these are just some of the activities we were able to launch with the VIPS grant. And it's been an awesome journey so far, really understanding, you know, how grants work and how, how the community is working in COVID with partnerships specifically. So it's definitely been a challenge, um, but definitely uh, an enriching opportunity for us to be able to step into what mommy's in the D is really going to be able to become over the years. I love it. I love y'all are y'all are about it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. That is awesome. <laughs> and I mean, and, and you mentioned something there too, because oftentimes people think, okay, well, we work with the moms. Now they have the babies. All right, that's it. But you guys are ensuring that even beyond that time, they still know that, hey, these are the resources that are available. Mm -hmm. These are some people that you can partner with. If you have needs, let us know. 
you know, it doesn't matter that your, your kid is, is born, your kid is a year, you guys are working with those moms who have the toddlers who are getting ready for kindergarten. Do you have a lot more of those, a, a lot more um, young moms with um, slightly older kids um, getting ready for, for elementary school? Well, actually, I actually, I actually have more moms that have smaller children. Now, if we were to look at moms where they have multiple children, we definitely have a lot of moms that have multiple children, like they might have a three-year-old and then a newborn. So uh -huh. the cycle all works for them, you know, but definitely working with um, mothers that I started off with was important to me to make sure that they know that this isn't a drop-off, like I'm only working with a one to three. Now, at some point, it will be like, okay, like you've gotten everything that you need from me. This is more about self-efficacy because we want them to know like, you see exactly how we're finding these resources, even for you. So now you are able to go off and now help a mother that also might be in that place of being scared and not exactly knowing where to go or how to make sure that they're understanding these resources. So they help out as kind of these mentors as well, or they come and find leadership opportunities in our mommy advisor um, group. So they're able to even do community service events or help out uh, schools in understanding, hey, like, you know, you want to finish your school and you want to make sure I did it, like I did it so I know that you can do it. You know, just sharing their testimonials, sharing their experiences, definitely not speaking for them because they can definitely tell their own story. So even tell, talking to the moms that have the older children or toddlers or even multiple children, it's really important for them to understand at that point, the self-efficacy and how to keep going and what does that adult, those adult steps look like? Because even if they have children that are um, four or five years old, they're still 19 or 20. Like, <laughs> where were we at 19 and 20, you know? And so those are the things that I'm looking at that makes it so under, uh, it's, it makes it so important that I don't just cut something off uh, as soon as their, you know, their child gains a certain age. I definitely understand why that's necessary in some cases, but since this is a community effort to make sure that the village is answered for, the village is get, providing for the actual needs, we definitely have seen that the needs are still there even when that child is getting older because now the mom is trying to understand, okay, how do I get a place of my own, but how do I make sure that this child is ready for school? You know, and it's still, it's still a continuation so even evaluating this and understanding what this looks like for someone that has known me or known mommy's in the D for three years, as opposed to someone that is just coming in as a first time pregnant mother, we're looking at those differences to make sure that we can answer to all of those things. Um, so your mental health matters really might resonate with a mom that has an older child and kind of knows some of those resources because they've gone through that with me, but they still might be on those smart goals of understanding, how do I take care of myself? However, setting a strong foundation would be really good for a first time mother who's, you know, young, who might not know any of the resources in the community. And so we want to make sure that we're uh, providing it to a, a variety of mothers because trust me, they're, they're definitely uh, starting to have babies at 13, 12, and it really just depends on the neighborhood. But um, we want to make sure that we're answering to those things because they're definitely, they're definitely here. Like it's definitely real. <laughs> And, and that brings me to another point, too, because if they're having kids at 12 and 13, right, that's middle school. Mm -hmm. So what, what, who have you been able to align with in the realm of sexual education? Because it's one thing to say, okay, let's support, let's provide. Mm -hmm. But we, we all know that sexual education in this country is lacking. Oh sexual education, I, I, don't, I don't know what they teach the kids in school. I don't want them to teach my kids about that. Like we, <laughs> my kids and I already have these conversations because I think it's important. Something as simple as body awareness, knowing your anatomy, things like that, because people think sexual education is this, you know, well, we're going to talk about sex and penetration and, uh, you know, and that's one part of it, but sexual education stems from, you know, something as simple as understanding your own anatomy. My goodness. So I actually studied this with my master's. I did a thesis on the sexual health education aspect around DPS. Surprisingly, uh, or Detroit Public Schools, surprisingly, they are abstinence only sexual health, you know, education based, you know, district, which was very surprising to me because I did I did question that while I was uh, working in the school. Like I was, I was wondering 
why aren't they having these conversations about healthy relationships or why was there not always a sexual health education teacher and especially with my thorough research around sexual health and what does this look like in comparison to possibly Ferndale or some of the more suburban um, uh, school districts, I was realizing that parents really had a choice of the understanding if they can have comprehensive sexual health education, which does discuss the use of condoms, which does uh, which does cover LGBTQ education, um, but abstinence education kind of trims the focus on to sex before marriage like it's bad it doesn't happen it shouldn't happen and like your knowledge about condoms your knowledge about safe sex your knowledge about understanding your being is not is not going to be talked about because it shouldn't be talked about maybe it's not appropriate you know that was the interesting point um that i was i was seeing and i definitely even at when i was younger um i definitely see that parents kind of stray away from that or you will see it in a community and it will be so you know it, it's not a secret thing but it might be taboo because it's like okay i know that these people like each other so this is what they do and they like each other and sometimes it might stay in you know stay in your mind as a question of until it actually happens to you. And so even when, you know, I was growing up, I really believed that, you know, the, the birds and the bees talk or just in general sexual health education, it kind of did tie into that abstinence only realm, which kind of shuts down the why and what and how questions, you know? And I think that those are the questions that are sometimes needs to be answered in school. Unfortunately, DPS and, and which is, it probably is really needed is not talked about how people might think. Like just because a school is supposed to offer this is not the reasons like why it's not being offered. We can look at the school uh, shortages of teachers. And so that means that there's less teachers to actually even teach about the health, uh, sexual health e education realm. We can look at the need to really have, you know, uh, teachers in other classrooms as substitutes. And so the sexual health education teachers that should be teaching that are now in the history classrooms. You know, um, some, sometimes it's just in general, the school closings or the things that are priority to the school is not equally up to sexual health education and so where does that leave a community who is you know 46 percent in poverty where does this leave the community that sees so much trauma where does this leave the community that sees gang violence and drugs as a normal thing you know um gun violence any of these things as a normal thing now this doesn't say that this community is just about these things however the education that you find from your external factors in your environment definitely have a play on how you see relationships how you see sexual education or uh based off of how the hood has taught you or the streets have taught you and unfortunately that's just not something that is you know really expounded upon because a lot of these families this this is a cycle and you know mm -hmm like really offering up the education that Mommies in the D is really trying to offer is trying to help the break the cycle of ignorance or break the cycle of making sure that these moms know, hey, breastfeeding, what, I know what you've heard about it. You might want to sexualize it. You might call your, you know, breast titties, you know, all of these things, they're, they're actually here as a first food. They're actually here to produce um, milk for your child. This, this milk that you producing and that, that you're trying to get rid of, it can fight off infections in your children. Um, this, isn't, this isn't something for the, your child's father. This is actually something to make sure that your child, you know, and a free form at that but make sure that your child is nourished and to make sure that they, they're having the best experience um as far as feeding goals um mm -hmm. and so you know it's just a lot of switching out mindsets to different perspectives of what they might have been known uh known to to see around their community and then it's like oh okay i'm now open up to this new world of and nobody else in my family might have done this but i'm mm -hmm. now open up to this new world of what motherhood could look like or what options we have as a mother how can I be empowered as a mother and so you know it really is about the power of perspective um and and who you choose to be around your village but also combating the stigma around this this 
hood, this Detroit area being, you know, ignorant, like, no, the Detroit actually sticks together quite well. And just because stigmas might hold people down, that doesn't mean that the community isn't coming back for what is already theirs. And that is the knowledge, that is the power to have control over their own bodies and uh, for the youth to be able to live lives where they can be children you know um, we're coming back for them and we're not going to leave them behind to just be ignorant because there's too many resources here there really are yeah it's, a, it's amazing that you mentioned um you know all the other traumas and all the other factors from the community violence um domestic abuse all these different things that might play and it's interesting that you know if if these things aren't talked about because we see them we say, oh, they're happening, or it might just because it's this neighborhood or whatever, but we see them when we don't address them. Right. And oftentimes what will happen is the recipients of said trauma will seek solace somewhere. And, and unfortunately, oh sexual goodness. relationships and bad sexual relationships can be one of those places where they seek trauma. So if they're not knowledgeable, now we've just created, you know, something even worse because now these kids are, are, you know, these young women are getting into relationships to try to seek solace away from all the other things that are happening only now to, to have another issue come up about, which is, you know, teen pregnancy. So again, I mean, I love, I absolutely love what you guys are doing um, in Detroit. If people want to get in touch with you, if people want to know more about Mommies in the D, how to support Mommies in the D, how to partner with you guys, you know, whatever have you, how will they find you? Yes, well, they can find us at mommiesinthed.org. That is our website. So you all can follow us there and you can subscribe to our newsletters. You can also find us on Facebook, so facebook.com slash mommies in the D. Um, and you can also find us on Instagram at mommies in the D. We do not have a Twitter. I do not understand it enough. Uh, you and I both, deal. honey, you and I both. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not sure what exactly do you post on Twitter. However, um, you can find us on Instagram. You can find us on YouTube to see some of our mommies, uh, mommies day recap and um, breast black breastfeeding week um, panels discussions. Um, we do have those available on our YouTube as well. So if you type Type in Mommies in the D and YouTube, you'll be able to find our YouTube page as well. But yes, you can find us at our website, Facebook, Instagram, Mommies in the D, or you can look on YouTube as well. That is awesome. So guys, if you are listening, teen pregnancy is a real issue. We can sweep it under the rug. We can say that it doesn't happen. We can continue to chastise the people who are affected by it. Okay. Or we could decide, you know what, let's do better. Let's, Let's make sexual education comprehensive and not, we don't have to over-sexualize things. We just need to educate. And the problem mm -hmm. is we're not getting education. Good sex education starts from home. And we know, unfortunately, a lot of the parents of these teens, they don't have good education, good sexual um, health education. So they need to be educated as well. It takes a community effort. And I'm so, I'm so happy for this episode. I cannot wait for, for this to air. I am so excited because these are the things that we need to talk about. These are the things that nobody is talking about. And we need to start breaking the cycle, right? We need to do away with the taboos. We need to educate these young women. So they made a mistake. Show me somebody in life who hasn't. Let's build mm -hmm. them up so that they don't make another one. And so the next generation doesn't come behind them and make the same one. Right. We don't want to keep making the same mistakes. We want to keep building our communities up, building our kids up, building our moms up, building our families up. That's what it's all about. So, Marquita, I thank you so, so much. Oh, man, this this was deep. I thank you so much for sharing that information and, and just sharing all the things that you guys are doing in the Detroit metro area. Again, if you guys are, you know, in the Detroit metro area, please, please, please check out Mommies in the D. If you know a young lady that is in need of help or resources, please direct her to Mommies in the D, either through their website, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. If you are wanting to help, if you're wanting to become a partner, whether you are um, in healthcare, you know, a, another birth professional, or whether you just want to donate, please reach out to Mommies in the D as well, show them your support, show them your love, um, and let's help more young women.
All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us again for yet another episode of VIPs in Action. This one was amazing. This one, I mean, I say that about all of them, but this one was awesome, y'all. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Marquita, for joining us today. We will be back again next time for another episode of VIPs in Action. So stay tuned, guys. Take care.